Welcome back to Van Dien with Doc Rock here on MorningShowCentral.com. What a great night we're having with this show, and what a special guest. I've had a lot of guests in that chair, but I haven't had anybody with the credentials of John Gorman. Welcome to Van Dien, John Gorman. Hello, thank you, Doc. No, it's great good to, to see you. Oh, it's great to have you here. Now, for those of you who don't know who John Gorman is, then get out of the music business, okay? But I will tell you what a bio. This is the kind of bio that... that uh, anybody would ever want to have in business. John Gorman, president of Gorman Media, is a media consultant and talent coach. That's right. His first book is called The Buzzard, Inside the Glory Days of WMS and Cleveland Rock Radio, a memoir, which covers his years at the station. Of course, it's in its third printing already. Yeah. Wow, congratulations. You know, John Gorman's radio career began in Boston while still in high school at WORL uh, Boston in 1966. For the next four <laughs> years, he worked at various Boston area radio stations including WBZ, WNTN, wow, and of course <clears throat> Gorman was also a columnist for the New England Scene Magazine and the nationally distributed Fusion Magazine. He was also part owner of uh, Cabin Essence, a music magazine, which you edited. Yeah. Oh, wow, you are multi-talented. Well, guess what, Cleveland? In July 1973, John Gorman joined WMS here in Cleveland as the music director. Three months later, he was pr promoted to program director, a position held until 1983. During during that time, WMS became the most listened to and highest revenue generating station in Ohio. And in 1983, John Gorman was promoted to operations manager for WMS and WHK and national program director for the parent company, Malwright Communications. And of course, that same year, John Gorman founded his independent radio consultancy, Gorman Media. September 1986, you don't stop, do you? John Gorman joined Metropolis Communications, WNCX Cleveland as vice president and operations manager. The following year, he just goes into full-time media consulting with the clients all throughout North America, including eight of the top 10 U.S. markets. And then moving into 1989, while maintaining his consultancy, John Gorman joined the Los Angeles-based Legacy Broadcasting Group as Vice President of Programming and Vice President Director of Operations for WJMI, uh, WMJI here in Cleveland. And of course, during that time, WMJI became Cleveland's radio and revenue leader. Anywhere John Gorman goes, I mean, the, the success just follows. It, uh, well, and that's important in radio, you know. In 1994, uh, WMJI was purchased by Omni America Group along with WMJI. MMS and Gorman became Vice President and Director of Operations for the Market uh, AAA and Vice President of uh, Programming for All Omni America Group Properties. 1996, following the sale of Omni America Group, Gorman performed his media consultancy with, and uh, which expanded to include online broadcasting and marketing. In 2010, yep, that was just last year, 2010, John Gorman joined Fusion Multimedia and Marketing for special marketing and promotion products. He, uh, he, uh, projects. He now divides his time between Gorman media and fusion what little time he's got left after all this so he has numerous broadcasting and charitable awards has been inducted in the ohio radio television broadcasting hall of fame in 2000 and received the cleveland icon perseverance award from the cleveland entertainment coalition in 2006 John Gorman was inducted into the Cleveland Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame in April of 2008. He is celebrating his 45th year in the media and communications industry. Wow, that is great. Now he does, he's still in Cleveland. He lives in Bay Village, right? And with his wonderful wife broadcaster, of course, Ravetta Michelli. What an illustrious introduction. I mean, that is... I, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted just <laughs> <laughs> so are the Hang with us. I mean, the man is really, truly one of the most celebrated people in radio, and that we are really humbled to have you here on the show, John. You know, I've got to ask you, when did the glory days of Cleveland Rock end, or did it ever? Well, it it didn't end. It's just slightly uh, submerged right now. Ah. As you can say, the talent has never left this market. Okay. It's just the ability to expose the talent has. Okay. And and that probably is a real change that, that has happened. Not only this market, but a number of markets. And a lot of it has to do with uh, radio deregulation. Mm -hmm. You have a handful of companies that own most of the stations in, in America right now. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have, we've lost the, the localism, the regionalism, which is the very thing that creates new talent, that builds new talent. And, uh, you know, every time that something like this happens, if there is a need for it, there is, it's usually invented somewhere else or it reinvents itself, it resurfaces. 
And, uh, you know, look at this, for example, internet television, right. online right. television, you, online radio, internet radio is becoming very strong. And I, don't, I just don't mean, you know, the Pandoras and, mm -hmm. and, and the uh, do-it-yourself radio stations, mm -hmm. but the fact that you can listen to worldwide radio streaming on the internet. Not only this on country, but almost any country. Mm -hmm. So the technology is there. And it's how you use it. There are plenty of internet-only stations, like Radio Paradise is, is right. a great example. Uh, so for, for an act today, they really have to do research and see what's online, because if you're, if you're trying to reach a new music audience, chances are they're not spending a lot of time at terrestrial radio. They are now online and, and, and finding sure. music through other means, you know, as well as social networking. And things things change so much, obviously. But you know, maybe a little bit of synopsis uh, would be important about how rock radio programming, you know, has morphed along with these changes. I mean, these you know these these deregulations and these corporate holders yeah. now. You know, that's got to obviously affect programming because they're all going to be publicly traded companies and and probably in a cost cutting mode. Exactly. So how does this affect you know well, new dance? Well, here the, the probably the biggest problem faced uh, when radio was deregulated. Uh, the, the cost of a radio station went sky high and it was being sold by, by brokers who sold radio stations as well, buy them now because they're only going to be worth more money. It was being sold like real estate. Okay. Now we know what happened to the real estate market. <laughs> no. Well, the same thing happened to the radio market earlier. Okay. Because the problem was, yes, they wouldn't make any more radio stations. Those licenses became very valuable. but. There was none of the thinking. It was, it was looked at that you had a captive audience. People had to listen to radio in their car. They had to listen to radio at home. None of that was true, but that was what Wall Street saw. Mm -hmm. As a result, these stations were going for anywhere from 10 to, in, in, in the case of one station in Cleveland, you can say 38 times cash flow. Wow. If you single up WJMO AM and how much that sold for that was 38 times cash flow. Wow. How do you ever make that money back? You can't. Sure, sure. So these stations were, were bought and sold and traded, and each time they were being bought and sold for more, you know, uh, far more than they were worth, but, but drastic increases in prices. And none of these media companies looked at this newfangled invention just around the corner called the Internet. Mm -hmm. And when the internet first came along and the word social networking were first introduced, radio laughed. The, the radio executives laughed and said, that's never going to amount to anything. I remember I was uh, <laughs> at a station in Detroit and I was told by a general manager there that internet is the CB radio of the 90s. Oh boy. And that, that was the way of thinking. Don't get involved because I was, I was pushing the station to have an internet presence so the internet, that's going to be over in a year. That's be, and that was the way of thinking. But you were thinking that way because you were hoping it would be true. Right. You were hoping that investment, and, and, because you were starting to see sure. the chinks in the armor at that point. Because, okay, now you've bought the station, you paid 30 times cash flow for the station. How are you going to make it back? How mm -hmm. are you going to pay, you know, how are you going to service your debt? How are you going to pay more? And you can't just raise the ad rates in a competitive yeah. market. You know? And you can't raise the ad rates. Sure. And then, you know, what happened is stations increased commercial time, the commercial overload. And, uh, and buyers also knew what they were getting into. A buyer does not want to be the 15th commercial in a, a, a set of commercials. Okay. So, uh, you know, radio started to lose its value rapidly. And, uh, you know, you, you, we do have a case, you, you're still having a lot of trading going on, you're still having, a, a, you know, there's still few, there was just a merger between two companies, mm -hmm. uh, Cumulus and Citadel, actually Cumulus bought out Citadel. Okay. And I look once again, and I'll say it now, and let's, let's revisit it a year from now, how are they going to make money? Sure. Show me how they're going to make money, because I predict a year from now, those stations are going to be in dire straits. They are going to do massive wow. firing, they're going right. to cut back. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate. Wow, incredible. Thank God we have the internet. Oh well, yeah, well apparently, my goodness, it's uh, it's been a dramatic change. Well, you know, even with the types of radio though, the, there's you know, there's the commercial radio. What about the college market? Is the college market, you know, really yeah. having much of an effect on anything? Yes, the, co the college market definitely means something. College radio is where everything begins and will continue to, to be that way. Uh, the, the, the good thing about college radio is many college stations are now online. 
-huh. So they have a better reach and frequency. The problem that college radio always had was low watch. Okay. You know, it, it only gets so far. You can see, you you know, you can only pick Around up the time, WBWC sure. so far uh -huh. east. You can only pick up the John Carroll station so far west. Okay. So you do have those limitations. Uh, you know, the summit in Akron, which is actually owned by the Akron uh, uh, School Department. Oh. Uh, you know, you you can't get them beyond Drexville. Oh, but, okay. you know, they so they have they you know you, you're dealing with a very small radius, but anybody can stream online. I see. So as a result, college stations, if anything, may gain importance. Uh, KEXP, uh, right, University sure. of Washington, uh, it's considered mm -hmm. uh, one of the best radio stations yep. in America. That was started by Paul Allen, who has the Experience Music Project, the rival right. of the Rock and Roll mm -hmm. Hall of Fame here. Sure. Uh -huh. But he has done a very good job of linking the uh, that station with the Experience Music Project changing the call letters from whatever they were before to KEXP and he allows the uh, the staff enough creative freedom that they've, they've created a very decent radio station and we can listen to it online in Cleveland you know internet radio. Sure absolutely well you know from a little bit of a nostalgic standpoint uh, John if we can go back uh, for some of our younger listeners and uh, even their parents you know the, the yes. grand days of WMS when you really had you know, cohesive community radio, if you will. You know, especially in your case, because I know a lot of our musicians are watching. You know, how did you, how did you really pick bands for airplay back then? You know, was the was there a criteria, a protocol? Yeah, yeah, well, the one criteria was, and I, I have to give credit where credit is due. And I had an incredible staff. Yes, you did on the air yeah. and behind the scenes. And they made me look good. <laughs> you know, the, the, it, it really was everybody and everybody's in, uh, input mm -hmm. was encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, that station was truly a group effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was very much in tune with what was happening in Cleveland. I mean, we, we set out to be a Cleveland radio station. And beyond just being a rock station, we wanted to be a popular culture station. Mm -hmm. So we delved deep in the community. Uh, we we didn't do special, you know, Sunday night uh, programming that, that featured local bands. Mm -hmm. We tried to include as many local bands in normal rotation because, you know, the sad thing is, and I, and I support I support local music shows, but the sad thing is usually local music shows are being listened to by whatever bands are on that particular week and their families and friends and all that. Okay. And it's, you're not reaching a larger audience. I see. And it's really important that if those bands that you're playing on these Sunday night shows are good, put them in regular rotation. Give them a chance. Give them the exposure. That's, that's what we did at the old MMS. And it, it, it was also the effort of the staff because, as I said, the staff had a lot of input. You know, uh, Denny Sanders, for example, oh, did all yeah. those coffee break concerts. Yep. And a lot of those coffee break concerts were, you know, everybody remembers all the national acts mm -hmm. that performed right. on them, John Cougar and everybody else. Sure. But we also had a lot of local Cleveland acts that played on those coffee break concerts. And that was one hour exposure in prime time. You know, it, and, and you can't. That, that's well, not happening were, today, and, I'm sure. And of that day, you know, there were local bands that whose whose songs, quite frankly, they owe it to you because you did so much to break their songs. And I think of bands like you know Wild Cherry, uh, or bands like uh, or uh, Funky Funky Poodle yeah. you know, from uh, Wild Horses, Wild Horses, American Noise, American 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 Love Affair, Love Affair, yeah, Michael, of course, sure. Stanley, uh, even the, the Euclid Beach Band. Yep. There is no surfing. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was a great, great, great yeah, song. And I started that was as, as, as a charitable it's song. It was, right. And it turned right. into something greater. It turned into a one-hit wonder, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so to speak. Well, and of course, the major labels in those days, you know, the distributors were always, uh, the record weasels, I think, as they're referred to, you know. Yeah, that's, 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 a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, we'll try to find There's some good record guys, but there are plenty of weasels. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, their job is to get those, you know, get their artists played on the station.